One, two, three, there we go. Well, good evening. It's good to be with you. I'm joined tonight by my, uh, by my lovely wife, Jennifer, who is really a great encouragement to me, because just about every single time before I get up to preach, she tells me this one line that really motivates me. Because I want to I wanna proclaim and I want to say the words that, that Christ gives me, that his spirit gives me. And she gives me that last dose of encouragement every time. And this is what she says. She leans over to me every time before I preach and she says, Kevin, please do not embarrass me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so my commitment is not to embarrass her. Hey, I was at Chick-fil-A um, about six months ago. And I sit down to eat at Chick-fil-A, and we have a Saturday night service at our church. And after service, a group of us all go out to Chick-fil-A. And so I'm at Chick-fil-A eating dinner, and I see, I'm sitting there eating my dinner, and I'm on a pastor's salary, so I don't make a whole lot of money. So we have to budget to go to Chick-fil-A every Saturday night. And I see, out of the corner of my eye, this lady walk in, and she has six kids with her. Six kids, right? I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of kids. And so, you know, I just wish for a prayer. God bless her. I don't know her. Take care of her. And she goes up to the counter, and this is what God tells me. Kevin, go up and pay for her dinner. I said, God, I don't have enough money to pay for her dinner. I said, go and pay for her dinner. Oh, man. Okay, God. And so I go up to the counter, and I thought, I don't want to be weird. You know, it's just weird to ask a lady and kids, hey, can I buy your dinner? And so I'm there at Chick-fil-A, and she goes up to the counter. And I said, hey, I know you don't know me, but is it okay if I buy your dinner? And she looks at me, and this is what she says. She says, yeah. Just one question, though. I said, what's that? She said, can we get shakes, too? <laughs> and I think, I think, wow. And so I buy these, this lady's dinner, and she, she is, she's pregnant at the time, about to, about to pop, you know, about to have her baby. And so she, she, I order her dinner, and I talk to her for a little bit, and I told her I was a pastor. And about two weeks later, her and her husband show up at her Saturday night service. And they come walking in, they sit at the back, and, and then I think we move them forward, we, like, you know, visitors, like, you can't sit at the back, we got a place on the front row right for you, right? And so we move them forward, and then after the service, God tells me, I need to go and talk to this couple. And so I invited them down to my office, and her husband's name is Antonio, and they have six kids. And here's the story. Antonio is a heroin addict, and he's in my office. He's, he used heroin every single day. In fact, the story goes, he was mad at his wife. Because she was taking their last little bit of money to Chick-fil-A to buy the kids dinner. And he wanted to use that money to go buy another hit of heroin. And so he's in my office. And he starts weeping. And, and I'm paraphrasing what he says. But he says, Kevin, I, I really want to be a good husband. I really want to be a good dad. I just, I'm using these drugs. And I really want to be a godly man. And in my office, I'll never forget that. He accepts Christ as a savior. Yeah. And, and, and no, no, it gets better. Listen to this. And, and, and a few weeks later, I baptize him. And about a month or two later, I, I baptize her. And all the while, I'm thinking that they're married. And then he tells me, he says, we're not, we're not married. And I'm thinking, buddy, we got to clear this up quick. You know? <laughs> we got to get you to start living godly. And so we did this big ceremony for him at our church and invited the whole church. And it was awesome, this couple. And God is, re in fact, during the process between when they came to church and I met them at Chick-fil-A, they got their kids taken away from them, all six of them. And, and the day that we married him, their kids came. And it was beautiful because Antonio, I married him, and I'm standing on the stage, and Antonio is here, and Q is here, and their son, who, who's 10 years old, uh, maybe he's younger than that, is eight or nine years old, he is weeping the whole service uncontrollably because he, an eight-year-old kid is watching God restore his family. Mm -hmm. I can tell you this, six months later, six months after the time I met them, both of them are completely 100% drug-free. And not only that, both of them are leading people to Christ. In fact, I took them to a revival that I did. They're praying through with people, and Antonio feels a call in his life to be a pastor. In fact, I've invited them here tonight. Antonio and Q, stand up so everybody can see you. for you guys you can be seated now let me tell you this we literally i don't know if you know this but we literally have the greatest news in all of history 
And like, I don't just tell you that just because that's like a pastor thing to do. In fact, I'm not very seasoned. I've only been a Christian myself about nine and a half years. Nine and a half years ago, I was Antonio. I was a drug addict. I was a deadbeat dad. I was an alcoholic. In fact, I was abusive, physically abusive towards my wife. And, and, and I encountered Christ through this little Nazarene pastor who brought me the gospel, and it changed everything about me. Literally, it set me free from drugs. It restored my marriage. It restored right relationship with my kids. And so I don't stand before you, somebody that just says, oh, I believe the Bible just because, you know, it's a book, or I believe in Christ just because a pastor told me about him. Like, I'm a believer because of every single thing that I've seen him do in my life. And, mm-hmm. and, and here's what Revelation tells me. Hey, anybody ever read the book of Revelation? We stay away from that book, but it's a beautiful book. In Revelation, in Revelation, it talks about this book called the Book of Life. And I want you to go here with me, right? In the Book of Life are the names of those people that are saved. And so imagine if God did this tonight. If God came to me and he said, Kevin, I'm going to give you the Book of Life. You're only going to get it for about five minutes. I want to show you the names that are written in that book. And so he gives me the book. And I'm thinking, uh oh, here we go, right? And so I start, oh my goodness. Like, I see your name in this book right here. You're, oh my goodness, your name, you're, literally, your name is written in this book. Man, let me make sure my name is written in this book. Let's see. <laughs> my name's written in this book. Oh my goodness, my name is written in the book. And here's the reality if we're followers of Christ and we belong to Christ Jesus, our name is written in this book. And we don't just, it's for us, this is, this is not a game that we're playing. I mean, this is everything. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, Christ came to restore us back. I I know so many Christians. And so, if I can say this, most of you I'll probably never see again because we'll go back home to Southern California. And my wife said, don't don't give them any fluff tonight. Here's what I know. So many pastors and Christians kind of treat this like a game. This is not a game. Mm. I I heard a story about, about a guy. He was sitting on his computer one day. He was sitting at his computer, and his wife catches him in the act of looking up pornography on the computer. She walks in the house and sees her husband looking at her computer, looking at pornography on the computer. And she goes over to him, and she starts screaming at him. What are you doing? What is this? You look at pornography? What are you doing right now? And she touches him, and he doesn't move. And it turns out he had a heart attack while he was looking up pornography and died. Mm. Think, true story. Think about this. One minute, you're looking up pornography, and the very next minute, you're standing before God's throne. Think about that. Mm. Think about the magnitude of that. He sat down. I'm going to look this up on the computer. Boom, he's dead. The next minute, man, he's kneeling before God's throne. Isaiah tells us kind of what God's throne looks like, right? If you've ever read Isaiah 6, like the throne of God. This guy was standing before God's throne in an instant. And here's the reality for all of us in this room. One day, all of us are going to stop breathing. Most of us in this room can't even believe we're as old as we are. (laughs) All of us are going to die someday. We're not guaranteed of tomorrow. The Bible tells us that life is a breath. It's here and then it's gone. We get one chance at this. Literally, we get one life and that's it. And one day, you're going to stand before God and give an account. Are you taking this serious enough? I heard, this, I heard this beautiful story. Anybody ever seen the movie Braveheart? My favorite movie is Braveheart, right? It's about the story of William Wallace, and he's fighting for Scotland's independence from England. In fact, I preached I preach a this similar message at a, at a church in California, and I brought this uh, Braveheart illustration up, and this is what he said. He said, I really did not like your sermon. I said, why? He said, because I'm English myself, and the Scots fought against the English. <laughs> But, 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 but the beautiful movie, but the, the true life story is William Wallace leads the fight uh, against England for Scotland's independence. And William Wallace dies, and another guy takes over the baton in leading Scotland in their fight for independence. And his name was Robert the Bruce, and he was a great leader. And at the end of Robert the Bruce's life, he had one last request. This, this, this is crazy. This is what his request was. He said, when I die, take my heart out of my chest and embalm it. Robert the Bruce was the king. Take my heart out and bomb it. And every single time that you go into battle, hold my heart up and say this, men, fight for the heart of your king. I love that. Mm. We say that, that's my battle cry. 
even tonight? Are we fighting for the heart of our king? One day when we're standing before God and we're given an account of our life, we're going to give an account, and thank God for Jesus on that day, because we'd be in trouble on that day. Mm. And we're going to give an account, and on that day, are you going to be able to look at God the Father? And you're being able to look at him in all of his glory. And you're going to be able to say that I fought for you, Father. With every breath that I breathe, I fought for the heart of my king. I fought for you. And the question as we gather in this place tonight is, what does fighting for the heart of God mean? Like, if you could look inside the heart of God, what would it look like? So on that day, if he says, did you fight for my heart? Did you fight for the heart of your king? Did, with every breath that you took, did you fight in seriousness of this? Did you get one chance at this? And that's all we get is one chance. Are you fighting for the heart of your king? My, um, my oldest son, Toby, is 13 right now. And when he was 10 years old, um, my son, Toby, was diagnosed with seizures. And he has, it's gotten better the older he's gotten, but he sometimes has about two to four seizures every single hour. It, it affects his, he can't play sports. He's a good little athlete, it affects his education. He likes to always use it as an excuse for why his grades aren't higher than they are. But he might not be able to drive. And my prayer since he has had these seizures, and if you could like, you could like look in my heart, like in my heart, you would see a dad that wants his son healed from that. And I've prayed, I've cried out to God, and I've fasted, and I've had people lay hands, and like, God, heal him, God, heal him, I believe, I know that you can open the eyes of the blind, I know that you can do this, God, just heal him, just heal him, God, heal him, heal him, heal him, heal him. He hasn't been healed yet, but it's coming, I believe, with all my heart it's coming, because I know the power of God. But if you can look in my heart, you would see a dad, that, that, that like his heart is broken every time that he sees his son, he just wants his son healed. And I think that if you could look in the heart of the father, you would see breakage, I believe. Listen, listen to the scripture from 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5, and I think it's going to be up here on the screen. And, and I don't want you to just, I don't want you to just read this. This is not a game. Like this, this is God's word. My, my son Toby was watching TV the other day, and he, he was watching wrestling on TV. And this is what he said. He said, Dad, that must hurt. And I said, buddy, it's not real. He said, no, Dad, they're hitting each other over the head with a chair. It's real. I said, no, I, I said, no, no, buddy, it's not real. It's fake. He said, Dad, they're really, no, it's fake. Like, I think sometimes when we read the scriptures, we have a tendency to say, is this real or is it not? Let me tell you, this is real. This is true stuff. This is not a game that we're playing. Let's listen to it and take it serious. That's actually the wrong scripture if you have it there. You can take that one down. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5 says this. I'll let you get there. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5 says this. It says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live a peaceful and quiet lives in all goodness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. And I want you to get this right here. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man of Christ Jesus. I think if you could see the very heart of the Father, you can see it when you read the scriptures, it's this. That no one would perish. That, that, that no one, I want you to think about this. Every day there's people going to hell. That, that's really hard to hear. You have neighbors, coworkers, friends, family, that literally if they stopped breathing, if their life was to end, that they're going to hell. And God doesn't want that. In fact, in fact the very heart of the Father, I believe, is this, is that nobody would perish, that everyone would come to a saving relationship with the Father, that, 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 that everyone would be saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And let me ask you a question. If the Bible says that God doesn't want anyone to perish, do you think that he just said that? Or do you think that's even possible? Do you think it's possible the whole world could get saved? Yeah. I, I think it's possible. There's some, there's some that don't agree with that. But every day there's people dying and going to hell. In fact, this was my, this was my prayer for you tonight as I was sitting over in my seat. This is, this is the prayer. Some of you are going to be mad at me about this prayer. Most of us don't really care that people are going to hell. We don't, it doesn't bother us. We just keep living our life. We keep playing church. We come to service. 
We sing some songs, maybe even raise our hand in worship. But most of us don't care that people are going to hell. I'll tell you something, I wouldn't wish hell, wish hell on my worst enemy. I mean, it's horrible. Complete separation from God. This was my prayer for you tonight. That you wouldn't be able to sleep tonight. That your hearts would break so badly for people that you know that don't know Christ. And so when you don't sleep tonight, you can blame me. But most of you will probably never, ever see me again. Man, do we really care? Do we we care that it breaks the heart of the Father? That there's people going to hell? Does Does this bother us? Does this rattle us? Is it really like whatever? When we get one, I mean, when I'm standing before God with the one chance that I get, and I'm before God's throne and, I, and I'm worshiping Him on that day, and I'm giving an account, and I'm saying, God, I fought for your heart. I mean, how many people am I bringing with me? How many of you in this room, when you die, go, go into heaven when you die? How many of you believe that? How many of your name is in the book of life? Do you believe that? Mm-hmm. If you don't, come and have a conversation with me right after service. We'll make sure. But you're going to heaven when you die. Why not take as many people with you as you can? I mean, really. And here's the crazy part of this mission to depopulate hell. Christ has given all believers this mission. And I have another question for you. If you found the way, the truth, and the life, if you found the reason that you were created to be in right relationship with God, why are you still here? Like why, is, why, is it, why isn't Christ just taking you? You found the reason that you were created. You're, you're born again. You're saved. You're sanctified. Why are you still here? Like why isn't the Father taking you to heaven yet? Because there's work to be done. He doesn't want anybody to perish. And here's the crazy part. I want you to get this part if you don't get anything else out of this message. Here's the crazy part. Christ could have chosen any way to make his name known. He could, he could have chosen any way. I'm, I'm not sure I agree, agree with the way that he chose. Because I think sometimes, wow, that's the way that you chose. But here, here's the way that he chose. He chose to make his name known through the life of the faithful. The, the life of believers. Christ could, Christ could have had the greatest marketing campaign in all of history, that he's on every billboard, every television station, every radio station, so that everybody just sees Christ everywhere they go. God could have created us with this thing inside of us that just makes us believe in Christ. Christ could have just stayed. He could have just stayed so everybody would believe, but he didn't choose those ways. Choose that way. Which way did he choose? He chose to make his fame known to the world through the life of believers. And so it's the responsibility of everybody in this room. And the sad reality is most Christians don't take this serious. We don't think it's our job. Some people say, well, Kevin, you're talking about evangelism. I don't have the gift of evangelism. Don't use that as a cop-out. Because it's the mission of everybody. Now, some people do have the gift of evangelism. In fact, I have a good friend that he goes through McDonald's drive through lines and wins them to the Lord through the drive through <laughs> I was with him one time getting some coffee. And he's telling, when this lady, there's people behind us honking. I'm thinking, buddy, what are we doing? Yeah, this is more important than somebody behind me honking right now. I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> all of us don't have the gift of evangelism, but all of us should be telling people about Jesus. Mm. The greatest news in all of history. And you've been radically transformed. I told you Antonio's and Q's story. I told you my story. But all of us have been, have been revolutionized by this gospel. All of us have been changed by this gospel. Transformed. You go to bed at night with hope. Before I was a Christian, I would go to bed at night and ask myself, is this really all there is to life? High on the next drug, going to the next strip club, gambling my entire paycheck away. Is this really it? I mean, now I go to bed and say, man, I found the way, the truth, and the life. We have the hope of Christ. Let's share it with the world that desperately needs to hear it because if they don't hear it from you, they're not going to hear it. Mm-hmm. I wonder sometimes on that day that we're standing before God, if we're going to be accountable of every missed opportunity that we had. Every missed opportunity, every time we were at Chick-fil-A and she says, hey, go buy their, God, I don't, I don't have money to buy their dinner. Are you kidding? And they want shakes now too. I'm sure <laughs> I can do this, God. And here's what I believe. I, I, when I read the scriptures, I think we need, and, and for you church people, and I'm a church person too, so I'm in this category, I think we need to change the definition of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity for so long has, has just been, has been tough. And it's probably been a little bit wrong. Spiritual maturity means you show up for church every Sunday. That's how we've defined it. And you wear your suit. And you maybe tithe a little bit in the offering plate. I I had somebody one time that told me, they said, Kevin, I don't believe in tithing because it's Old Testament. I said, really? I said, do you know what the New Testament standard is? Go and sell (laughs) your possessions and give your money to the poor. 
So 10% or get rid of everything. You can choose which one you want to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> you make that decision. And so, like, we, we've kind of defined spiritual maturity as tithing or dressing up. Or we've defined spiritual maturity as, as I go to church. And I think we need to redefine spiritual maturity. And it's multiplication. How many people are you winning to Christ? How many people are you sharing the gospel with? we got to take this serious. You're still here for a reason. It's not just to get up, go to work, come home, go to bed, and do it over the next day. And so tonight, just over the next couple of minutes, I want to help you in this. Because, listen, my, my job tonight is not to feed you. Another big misconception that the church has, that it's the pastor's job to feed you. Show me that in the scriptures. Uh, so, sometimes people tell me, you pastors are like, amen, preacher. Right? There's so many times people have said, even to me, Kevin, I'm just not getting fed. You ever said that to you if you're a pastor in this room? Mm -hmm. I'm just not getting fed. Yep. And I'm thinking, well, I'm sorry. It's not my job to feed you. Imagine this. I have a four-year-old daughter. And let's say she turned 16. You come into my house one day, I'm spoon-feeding my 16-year-old daughter food. <laughs> you would say, that's kind of sick. What do you, she, she, she got hands. She can feed herself. What are you doing feeding her? This, but this is what we do in the church, pastor, feed me. Scripturally, I believe this. It's not our job to feed you. The, Ephesians 4 says that it's our job to equip you for works of service, to help you live out this gospel, and for day to help, to help, to help you live it out fighting for the heart of your king. So let me spend just a couple of minutes equipping you, because the worst thing that I can do is tell some funny stories. The worst thing that I can do is tell some, tell some one-liners. And then you to leave here and say, oh, that was a great message. In fact, I don't want anybody in this room to say good message tonight. Because that's not the hope. And that does no good for my ego. Don't tell me that. In fact, I, I want you to leave here tonight saying, I've got to do something about this. Like, I've got to live this out now. I can't just hear it. I can't just hear it. I can't just, can't just see a pastor get passionate about it. I've got to live this out. And I want to show you practically how you can live this out. And it's going to take courage. And it's not easy. But here's some ways that, that we can live this out. I want to I wanna point you to a second scripture. Luke 10, 2 says this. It says he told them, the harvest is plentiful. Jesus said this. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of a harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. How many of you read that scripture before? Beautiful mm -hmm. scripture. We've all read it, right? Jesus says there's this great harvest, and I believe that harvest is the gospel. The good news, people accepting it. And Jesus says the only reason we are not harvesting is not because the message isn't good, because the message is good. It's not because it's gone sour or stale or because it's a few thousand years old. Jesus says the only reason we are not harvesting is because of lack of workers. That's the words of Jesus. And so he says there's a solution to this. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. We, we kind of get this twisted too in the church. Because we say, Lord, send in workers. I need children's workers. I need youth workers. Send them in. And I pray that prayer a lot, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But Jesus says pray that the workers would be sent out. I'm praying tonight that there would be workers all across this auditorium where they would take this mission to fight for the heart of our king serious. If you love God, and I think that you do, why not fight for him with every breath that you breathe? The first way I think that we can live this out, and, and, and I don't want you to just hear this one, I want you to do it, is that you personally, not the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, you personally share the name of Jesus with everyone you encounter. Make this your challenge. And, and here's the lie that we have been told for so long about sharing the name of Jesus. We say three things. Don't talk about money, politics, or religion. That's a load of junk. I don't want to talk about religion, but I want to talk about Jesus. And we've we got to take this one serious right here. And the enemy has lied to us for so long, and the enemy's whispered in our ear and said things like, nobody wants to hear it. They're not going to receive it. Nobody want, you, you're going to fumble your words. You're not going to know what to say. The enemy has whispered this lie into all of us, and we believed it for so stinking long that we think it's our own thoughts thinking that. And here's the reality. The reality is, is that people know how empty they are in the world. They do. Ask them. I'm sure you've got coworkers that are constantly complaining. I'm sure you've got friends and family that are just down all the time. Most dirty, rotten sinners know they're dirty, rotten sinners. I know I did. 
Pe- people need this. People know how, imp- when you start telling them about Jesus, the guy that led me to the Lord, he's a guy named Pat Garcia. He planted this church in this little town outside of Springfield, Missouri. He led me to the Lord. He came to my house for six months, every single day, knocking on my door. This pastor, in fact, I almost called the police on him a few times. <laughs> I'm, no joke. He would come to my house. I'd be, I'd be drunk sometimes. I'd shut the door in his face. And he'd come to my house every day for six months. And I would say, man, what is this guy doing? And one day he came over to my house and he said, Kevin, I want to take you and your wife Jennifer out to dinner. And I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, I'm a pastor, and, you know, I want to take you out to dinner and get to know you a little bit. I said, buddy, I don't really care who you are. <laughs> You're not taking me out to dinner. But he knew two things. This is provenient grace, I believe. He knew two things about me. I typically will go to dinner with anybody if they do two things. If they agree to buy, and we go to Chili's because it's my favorite restaurant. <laughs> and so this is no joke. That, that's, that's like my unwritten rule. He said, I want to take you to dinner. And I said, no, I don't think so. He said, we're going to Chili's and I'm buying. I said, what? I said, Jennifer, let's go. Get in the car. Let's go, right? <laughs> and we get to Chili's. We get to Chili's and he's, we sit down. And he starts sharing the gospel in a way that I had never heard. He started talking about freedom. I mean, I craved freedom. He started talking about a new life. I wanted a new life. He started talking about a healed marriage. I wanted that restoration with my kids. Hope and satisfaction and contentment in life. And I sat across the table from him at Chili's crying my eyes out. Can this be true? And it was January 9th at 2 o'clock in the morning. We went to a coffee house after that that my wife and I became Christians. Mm. And we've never looked back. Man, imagine if this guy just said, listen, they don't want to hear what I have to say. Imagine if this guy just said, just said you know what, I bothered him enough. I'm going to leave him alone. No, he knew it was his mission to depopulate hell. For many Christians, we read the scriptures that we're supposed to go out and do this, and most times our pastors preach it, and most times we talk about this in our small group. But I'm from Memphis, and I'm a big Elvis fan. Anybody like Elvis in this room? (laughs) Elvis has a song that means something completely different, and so don't get mad at me for this, but he sings a song that says this, a little less conversation and a little more action, please. And I think that's what we need to do with this message in the church. Let's just quit talking about it all the time. Let's just just quit talking about it. Let's go out and live this out and make it my personal mission Mm. to win as many people as I can to Christ. I had this this girl that I met that she's 19 years old. I I was in a conversation with her. I asked her, I said, said, are you a Christian? This is what she said. She said, no, I'm not a Christian. And I said, why not? Like, why would you not want eternal life? And don't tell me that you're an atheist. It says, look at creation. Are you kidding me? You're, you're saying the sun shines, people fall in love, babies are formed in their mother's womb. The human eye, I heard, I heard that doctors can't even explain the complexity of the human eye. Don't tell me you're an atheist. That doesn't make sense. There's, there's really, I don't believe there's any rationale to that. So don't tell you, well, I'm not an atheist, I'm just not a Christian. So why not? Why, why would you not want healing and restoration and forgiveness? Why would you not want this? We have the greatest news in all of history. Let's share it with everyone that we can. The second way I think that, that we can do this, and this, one, this one's going to come down hard on a lot of us pastors. And some of you might get more upset with me the further we get into this message. The second one is this, I believe. We need to make depopulating hell the number one priority of our church. I guarantee you, if I was to look at your mission statements, your mission statement would say something a lot along the lines of making Christ-like disciples in our local community. In fact, that's the mission statement of the church of the Nazarene. So how well are you doing? How well are you doing at this? I read a quote this week that says this. In the last 20 years, we've changed our worship services. We've changed the way that we preach. We've changed our sanctuaries. Worship leaders now are wearing tight jeans when they lead worship. We've changed everything to be more modern and relevant, and we're still losing at that. Really? We, we think that changing the way that we worship is going to make much of a difference in the kingdom? We, we, think, that, uh, we think that changing the, the way our sanctuary looks is going to get people out of hell? I'm not saying those things are good things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. In fact, I had a friend in Florida pastor in a church, he'd been there about three months, 
And he called me. He said, Kevin, I want to quit being a pastor. I said, why? He said, I had the most horrible board meeting that I've ever had. I said, buddy, I, I want to quit after almost every board meeting like you do as well, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. He said, I want to I said, why do you, what happened? He said, the entire board meeting, we talked about the order of service and how they want to fire me because I changed the order of service. And he said, they, 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 they were promised me a computer, and now they're saying they're not going to buy me a computer. And, and they're mad because we changed a few of the songs that we sing on Sunday. You know what I told him? I said, that's really your priority of your church because that's what your leaders are talking about? I said, I have the best advice I can give you. I said, go out and find the most dirtiest, rottenest sinner in town, win him to Christ, and bring him to your next board meeting. Mm -hmm. And show, the, show your leaders this is what we're about. Man, it's, I, I believe this with all my heart. Like we, we, we read these articles, 10 ways to make your church grow. Three ways that you could pack your service out on Sunday. Let me, tell, let me tell you how your church can grow. And it's not even about church growth. In fact, God doesn't care how big your church is. God cares about one number and one number only, and that number is zero, that no one would perish. And so what we need to do, I believe, I believe more than anything else, we need to push mission back to the top of our priority list. Amen. It needs to come above everything else in our church, winning people to Christ and truly making disciples. It needs to be higher than administration, higher than organization, higher than the paint colors of our sanctuary. Higher than how, how good we do at first impressions. And this one's going to hurt. This one's going to hurt bad. Even higher than our theology. And some of you might say this. Well, mission is in our theology. And listen, I believe in our theology 110%. I believe we have the best theology in the whole world. How a person can be set free. A new life. I believe that. But so many pastors, theology is here and mission is here. And then you say, well, mission's in our theology. Really? Really, how many people have won to Christ in the last year? Nobody. But we preach great theology in our services. Mm. No. Mission has got to be the top thing that we do. In my church, you can't even serve in leadership if you're not winning people to Christ. Every board meeting, I go around the table. Tell me who you've won to Christ in the last month. And if you can't, let me help you. We push it to the top of our priority list. In fact, I told our church this when they hired me 17 months ago. I said, I'm not going to come in here and preach some good sermons and run to meetings and sit in my office today. We're going to work. We're going to win people to Christ. And if we quit winning people to Christ, I will resign because I don't deserve to be your pastor. Mission has got to become the number one priority of the church. How many of you ever heard of yacht clubs? Anybody ever been a part of a yacht club? Anybody know what a yacht club is? Do you know how yacht clubs started? You know, there's these big boats and people compete who has the nice boat. Yacht, yacht clubs started as search and rescue vessels. You probably didn't know this. And so these, this group of men, they, they would get together, and when, when ships would get stranded at sea, they would go out and rescue them. And this went on for years, and they were great at it. They were incredible at rescuing people lost at sea. Well, this one day, this guy had this bright idea. He said, listen, why don't we just not go out and rescue people? He said, he said, why don't we talk about it one day a week as well, all the people that we're rescuing? And they realized that they love talking about all the people that they're rescuing. And they started competing with each other. Then it became who got the bigger boat, who was making the most money, who had the, most, uh, had the best food on the ship. And that's how we got to the yacht club. Most churches today have become yacht clubs. We forgot search and rescue. Read the book of Acts. Search and rescue was the top priority of the church. The number one priority of the church. It beat music style in the church. It did. We have these, I guess worship wars are done now, they're saying, right? It doesn't matter. If somebody comes to Christ, it doesn't matter what kind of style of worship you have in your sanctuary. I can tell you this, it really doesn't matter. And pe people ask me all the time, like, like, like I, I pastored in Chinook. And the church grew, it grew from like 60 to somewhere with all of our church plants to about 500 people in two years. And in Junction City, we planted eight churches when I was in Junction City. And I've been at Gateway now, and churches exploded in growth. In fact, I, it was hard to even get here today. There's so much going on. And people ask me all the time, what are you doing? You should, you tell us what you're doing. Tell us the secret sauce. But there is not a secret sauce. This is not special gifting in a pastor because I'm not very gifted. The only thing that we did is push mission to the top of our priority list. It's everything to us, making sure that nobody goes to hell because it's the thing that's closest to the heart of the Father. It's the thing that's literally close to the heart of the Father. And I'm sick and tired. Hear me as I say this. I'm sick and tired of breaking the heart of the Father. He's my God. 
He's my king. He restored me. I, I want to protect him. I want his heart to be whole. I want his heart to be happy. I want his heart to be content. I don't want him weeping over people that are going to hell. I want him celebrating, which the Bible says happens every single time that somebody comes to Christ. The Bible says, Jesus says this. Jesus says, he said, Father, as I have sent them, as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. You're a sent person. Our, church, our churches are full of missionaries every single Sunday, pastors. Hear me as I say this. Quit considering it your job to feed your people. You've been feeding people for years and it hasn't been working. They should be feeding themselves by now. And you've been a Christian for three years in this room, three years or longer. If you've been a Christian, three years or longer, raise your hand. Three years or longer, you've been a Christian longer than the disciples were before they went out and changed the world. You say, well, they had Jesus. Well, you've got God's spirit. Jesus said, it's better that I go away because if I go away, I'm going to send the comforter, the promise of the Father. Pastors, quit trying to feed your people and start equipping them. Every Sunday, equip them with this transforming message to go out into the world and share this life-changing message. It really is the greatest news in all of history. We just need to, we need more workers into the harvest field. Jesus said that. Listen, hear me as I say this, brothers and sisters. I'm tired of losing. I hate it. Like we have, we have four people in our community that died over the past week. Four people. I was thinking, man, do they know Christ? What could have I, I, I maybe should have went to their house. I maybe she just got to know him a little bit. Maybe, maybe I could have been the one. Maybe they're in hell right now because I didn't take this one serious. Every, every uh, Tuesday night, Antonio and Q were part of it. Every Tuesday night, my wife and I have about 50 new believers that come into our house every Tuesday night. And we just share it. And I love, I love, if, if you talk about real ministry, man, meet with some new believers. Questions like, how do I pray? Questions like, you know, what, what is you know, somebody asked me the other day, he said, you know, so John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and then he wrote the Gospel of John? It's like, no, it's different, John. You know, questions like that that I just love, right? And, and sometimes people say, well, you open up your home for 50 people? Yes, I open up for 50 people, because i got to set the example. I, I want people to see that new believers, winning people to Christ, and getting them disciples is the top priority of our church. You want to silence naysayers in your church? Win people to Christ, get back on mission. I love the fact that early Nazarenes believe this. What's happened to us? What happened to us? This is not okay. And I know I'm harping on you. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. If this guy hadn't have come to my house, if somebody hadn't have brought you the gospel, you wouldn't be in here tonight. I, my first year of ministry, I was pastoring in Springfield, Missouri. I'd been pastor there about six months, and the church grew from 50 people all the way down to 30 people in my first six months. <laughs> the finances were tanking. I wasn't getting paid very much money. I actually had to go supplement my income and get a second job to supplement my income. My wife was calling me saying, Kevin, I don't know how we're going to pay the bills this week. She called me one day and said, Kevin, there's no food in our kitchen, and we got to feed our kids. And I remember I went to church. I snuck down in the food pantry, took food out. I'm not sure if it was stealing or not, but I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> took food out and took it home and fed my family. One day it really got to me. I was losing, and I was tired of losing. I was tired of just preaching sermons and nobody coming to Christ. I was tired of just doing the same old thing over and over again. And I wanted to quit. In fact, I told God that. I said, God, I just want to quit ministry altogether. Just get me out of here. A prayer that probably many pastors have prayed, especially when they have a bad Sunday. And I went on my knees in this bathroom at this Mexican restaurant in Springfield, Missouri. I was at a breaking point. I got on my knees, and I'll never forget, as gross as it sounds, there was a liquid on the ground hitting my knees, and I didn't care. And in that moment, I cried out to God. I said, God, maybe you didn't call me to ministry. I said, God, what do you want to do? I'm failing as a pastor. God, what do you want to do? I just want to quit. There's urine on my knees right now. I don't even care. God, I'm so ashamed. I can't feed my family. My wife's wondering how we're going to pay the bills. Eviction notice. And, and I got to do it. And we want me to go out and get a third job, God, because I will. I'll do it. And this is what God told me as I'm sitting there on my knees. This was my, this was my transforming moment in my ministry. This was my conversion in my ministry. 
This is what God said to me. Kevin, give me your ministry, and I'll use you to change the world. He said, for this whole time, you've been doing ministry your way, prioritizing the unimportant things, fighting over carpets in the sanctuary, fighting over who's using the copier and what the code is going to be. Some of you know what I'm talking about on that one, right? Fighting about stupid things that really have no eternal value. He said, give me your ministry. And there I was on my knees, and I surrendered my ministry to the Father. And this was the ministry that he gave me. He said, win as many people as you can to Christ, and then you can die. Many people in this room, like, we've been doing ministry for so long. We've been preaching the same sermons for so long. We've been pastoring the same churches for so long, and there's been no life transformation. There's been the same old things. And I have a question for you as we gather in this room tonight. Have you prayed this prayer? Have you listened for God to respond to this prayer? I think God would tell you the same thing. Because most of us in this room want to make a difference with the one life that we get. Most of us in this room want to change the world. Just like the disciples did. I know I do. I want to make the biggest impact, the greatest impact with the gospel. Have you given them your ministry? I believe that if you did, and I don't mean just playing games. I mean starting to take this, this, this message serious. This is the thing that's closest to the heart of the Father. Start taking this thing serious. Give your life towards making sure that nobody goes to hell. God will honor your church for it. I can tell you this. When we started winning people to Christ, God just started sending us drug addicts off the streets and, and broken marriage. He said, listen, I, I trust you with these people. I'm going to send you a whole bunch of more people. That's what, God, that's what God is. Last thing I would challenge you to do today is this. Why don't you pray that prayer? Why don't you get converted into ministry right where you're at? If somebody, as you walked in, you leave here, somebody completely different. Giving your life to this mission and making sure that nobody goes to hell. If you start losing sleep at night because there's people in your community that don't know Christ. I think if we really believe this, we wouldn't stay silent about it any longer. One day the whole world is going to see that Jesus really was the Messiah anyway. Why not tell him now? I don't know about y'all, but I'm sick of just playing church sick of the same thing every single Sunday. And I told God that, and God said, give me your ministry. Give me your ministry, and you'll change, I'll change the world through you. I uh, will close with this. I, uh, I grew up playing baseball. I was an avid baseball. I thought I was going to be a Chicago Cub, in fact. I was going to be the guy that took him to the World Series. And so I played baseball in high school. I went to this big high school in Memphis, Tennessee, and I've made the baseball team. And I was so excited. My sophomore year, the coach let me dress for varsity, and I was so excited. I didn't play all year until the state championship game. And the coach, in the sixth innings, we only played seven inning games. The guy on first base that was running got hurt. And there I am in the dugout with my uniform on. Hadn't played all year. I was great at, you know, doing the butt slaps and the high fives to the players when they came in the dugout. That's kind of what I did. I just cheered them on. Helped him warm up, and the guy on first base gets hurt. And coach looks down at the other in the dugout, and this is what he says. He says, Kevin, get in the game. And I'll never forget my reaction to that. I was overcome with fear, overwhelming fear. And I hadn't played yet. I hadn't done this yet. I don't even know really how to, how do I run bases in a state championship game? I don't want to be the guy that messes this up for everybody on the team. I'm on one end of the dugout, the coach is on there. Coach says, Kevin, get in the game. This is my reaction, no joke. I said, huh, yeah, right. I said, Kevin, get in the game. Let's go, what are you doing? You've waited for this. This is, this is, you're wearing the uniform, let's go, get in the game. Coach, I don't think so. My, my leg, I, I didn't stretch before I got here, you know. I, my, my, you know, my the shirt is not tucked in. Coach, I, I don't know. And coach says, sit down. I'll put somebody else in the game. And here's the reality. He did put somebody else in the game, and I stayed my butt on the bench. As we gather in this room tonight, I believe the Father is inviting every single one of us in this room, every one of us to start taking this commission seriously, to depopulate hell. Listen to the voice of the Father. He'll tell you, my heart breaks for those that don't know me. 
the very first person I ever led to the Lord was a guy by the name of Reuben. 18-year-old kid. Reuben was always happy. I asked Reuben one day, I said, Reuben, you must be a Christian. You're always smiling. This is what he said. He said, I'm not a Christian. I said, what are you then? He said, I'm a Satanist. And I said, whoa, Reuben. He said, no, no, it's not what you think. I said, no, it's exactly what I think. Don't play games with this. And I shared the gospel with him. And Reuben became a Christian and accepted Christ. That was six years ago. The very first person that I ever led to the Lord. And it was in that moment, it was in that moment that, that I stepped out of the dugout. That I quit sitting on the bench saying, I'm going to cheer everybody else on. It was in that moment that I got into the game and it changed everything about me. And I've been running those bases ever since. And so brothers and sisters, get in the game. When you leave here tonight, go win somebody to Christ. Bring them back to assembly tomorrow. Win somebody to Christ now. Don't wait. What if in the next a split second, God forbid, you're standing before God's throne and it's your, you're done. There's no more other opportunities. Most, per, most percentage of Christians don't win people to Christ. Don't be in that percentage. Win people to Christ. Disciple them. Develop them. Grow them. Let's start winning again. You could see the heart of your father as we gather here tonight. Let me tell you this. Men and women of God, fight for the heart of your king. The greatest message in all of history entrusted to you to share with the world. So let's get to work. The worst thing we can do tonight is leave here saying, oh, that was a great message. God forbid that that happens. The best thing we can do tonight and say, God, I give you my ministry. Take it. God, I'm going to win as many people as I can to you. God, I'm going to put mission back to the top priority in my church. Let's start fighting for the heart of our king. Let's change the world, you and I. And next year at assembly, let's report millions of conversions in the Arizona District Church of the Nazarene. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. And we thank you that we can fight for you, our king. What a privilege it is that you allow us to fight for you, God. And Father, my heart, even as we gather in this place, and maybe there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know you. Maybe there's somebody, and we talk about fighting for your heart, God. Maybe, maybe they've never encountered you. Or maybe they've just gone to church and they've never just completely given their life to you, Father. I pray that your spirit would convict them tonight. Do what your spirit does best. And not only commit, God, convict the, the non-believer tonight, convert us that have been in ministry so long doing the same thing over and over and over with no fruit. Change us, God. Challenge us. Convict us in this. I've tried my hardest to preach it passionately, but that's no comparison to your convicting power, Holy Spirit. Convict our hearts. There's Antonios and Q's all over this community, all over Arizona. There's Kevin and Jennifer's just empty and desperate, waiting on someone to bring them good news. Redemption. Thank you, Jesus. In your name. Amen.